Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our third webinar in our uh, series of language at home webinars from the Cal PD team. And we're excited to join you here uh, today to talk about math and uh, how we talk about math in the home and uh, on our walks during this time. So we're happy that you're all joining us and um, just take a minute here to recognize the difficulty of this situation and that um, we've, we've found these webinars to be helpful distraction to us and keep us focused and help us think about students and families. So um, we're happy for your participation and hope that everyone in your family and friend circle and community um, are keeping healthy and well. So again, um, welcome to our webinar here on math and language. My name is Annie Duguay and we'll be introducing the rest of the PD team and a couple of our panelists in just a moment. Um, but you will find us as well on our Twitter. So we'll have more for you of that in just a moment. Um, you have uh, joined the webinar in mute and actually the, the GoToWebinar has that function so that it everyone will be muted. You'll hear various um, of our guest panelists and also our um, other PD team members unmuting themselves and, and sharing out today, but you have a questions box. And the questions box we use as our chat box. So sometimes you'll hear us refer to the chat box and we mean this question box. So you'll type a question in. Unfortunately, it doesn't get shared. We've learned with the whole group, but what we do um, will be to respond to you there. And when we respond to the whole group, uh, we can also respond to you privately if you have a specific question, but we do like to share as many of your answers as possible with the whole group. So um, we do our best to read and respond to all of them and uh, keep that chat box flowing. So an update that we have, we mentioned our, our um, communications director, Trey Calvin, have just joined Cal a couple weeks ago in the midst of all this, and uh, he's put together a great website so that all of our webinars, both the archived ones, as well as future webinars and registration and all of those um, links to handouts and PowerPoints are going to be directly on this one website, which we will continue to share with you moving forward. In fact, in a day or so, you'll get this email directly in, um, you'll get this web link in an email thanking you for your participation. So um, this will be moving forward our kind of one-stop shop for all of these resources. And um, so we have two previous ones. If you haven't joined us, there was an oral language one and also literacy last week. And uh, additionally, our colleague Roberta Maselli is doing Ed Policy One Takes. And if you weren't able to join yesterday, there was one on the impact of assessment waivers and the future of US education system for so for those of you who are um, you know who uh, deliver assessments or um, thinking about programmatic issues we also have funding opportunities and virtual instruction that um, Roberta will be delivering in on the dates you see and you can click and register directly there so also stay tuned for a three-part series of webinars that are specific to dual language education and I know there's some of you already who are working in bilingual dual language programs. So our colleagues pre are preparing to also do that set of webinars. So Mary Bell is going to take it away so we can do our introductions and hear from you. Okay. Hi, everyone. So glad that you were able to join us uh, today and, you know, take time out uh, from your busy schedules because it seems that even though I'm working at home, I'm working harder than I am when I'm in the office. So, uh, you know, when we talk to our students, to our, uh, to our own children, you know, they have a really hard time communicating during these, these kind of situations. So one really positive way of keeping in mind is to every day stop and think about what are your bright spots of the week? We have to think on the positive. So since we met last time, what I'd like you to do is in your questions box, write down what are your two bright spots. So for example, my two bright spots 
of the week were FaceTiming with my God's godson, who's out in Connecticut. He just brightens my day just listening to him. And I, I'm an avid reader, so I was actually, even though I was working the whole week, I was able to read four books that I really enjoy in a one week time period. So that's uh, really cool being able to do that. Now, if you take a quick peek at my colleagues, Annie, Maria, and Kate, you can take a look at what they wrote and take a minute out, just one minute, and in your questions box, write down what your two bright spots are for this past week. We're just gonna take one minute on this. So we really wanna hear from you. We're getting some really great answers out there. People who are trying new recipes, uh, trying to do some gardening. Someone mentioned daffodils, my totally favorite flower this time of getting that time to spend with our families. See a lot of people out in the garden. You're really taking uh, charge of the sun out there and really using it. A lot of cooking going on. Some more reading, reading books, reading poetry. This is all really great uh, as people are going through. And somebody actually wrote down that they created a flip grid. Awesome. So that really sounds like a fun activity. Now you can keep writing as you go along and we're going to start moving forward a little bit. And stop and take a quick peek at our agenda. It looks like just four things, but actually it's jam packed. Uh, we're doing our introductions right now, so we're seeing who you are. We're going to actually hear from some colleagues of yours out in the field who volunteered to share some of the things that they're doing. Then we're really going to start talking about different uh, issues having to do with language and math and take a look at some fun activities that can be done not only with students, but with our own kids at home. Kate actually uh, tried a couple of these at home and sounds like she had a great time. And then we're going to actually talk about what is it that you're doing. So our objectives and our goals for this week, you know, being a good SIOP uh, person, I use content and language objectives as do Annie, Kate, and Maria. So our content objectives is that we're gonna brainstorm resources and activities that promote interactive math language. Then our language objectives, what we're actually gonna do well, during the webinar is we're gonna talk and chat about how to promote math skills and language in the home. So, but we're gonna start first with meeting a couple of your colleagues who were joining us the past couple of weeks. And they have some stuff that they are going to be sharing with us. So we are gonna be starting with Milagro Schwartz, who's gonna be talking about the five ingredients for English learners in this era of the coronavirus. Milagros, are you with us? I'm with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Milagro Schwartz from Benjamin Franklin High School at Masonville Cove in Brooklyn Park, Maryland. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you, especially in the era of coronavirus that everybody is promoting online learning. As you can see, uh, it is very difficult. And then we have to do as much as we can to be able to promote restorative practices. And the next slide, we can see that English learners need structure, guidance, inclusion, flexibility, and patience. It is very important to keep in mind in these times that we definitely need to enforce the patient and flexibility ingredient more specifically because we're dealing with a lot of anxiety and 
tons, tons of ambiguity. So I am going to present a couple of activities that, that promote interactive language and math skills at home. I have heard through the uh, chat box and through the presentation that you are already uh, cooking, that you are already using recipes, and I'm going to show you a very practical, fun way to do it. On the next slide, you will see activities to do at home, like cooking with ingredients, for example. On the right side, you can see the recipe inspirations with apple, sage, pork chops, and then you have the quantities of the math. You can pretty much contextualize this and use your time with your child at home through the meaningful experience and restoring the moment. At this point, you will be able to not only teach fractions or portions or amounts or quantity, the language of quantity, the language of math for portions, but then contextualize it into the sensory part, which deals with apple and sage pork chops. This meaningful experience will allow your child or English language learner to have retention. Because what we're looking for in these times is to lower anxiety and upgrade retention. On the next slide, we can probably talk about the same thing, the sensory part, if you can look at the picture. There's the pigeon of love. It restores, it gives good feelings, and then you can have questions like what what do you think is happening? You can start with predicting what do you think the story would be about? You can then ask questions about it. Where is the pig? Where is the hen? How many eggs are there in the in the in the carton? Can you count the eggs? Things like, what might you do with, the, with an egg? And then take a story on whichever version you would like. You could do it on the, the, on the one, on one, uh, one hand, on the other hand, or you can add, invite them. Invite them to, to create their own story with the realia. Realia is powerful because it allows them to do very, it, it employ, explores tons of imaginative tools that our English language learners have. To add its structure to this, you can contextualize it to where is the hen? What can the hen do? And then begin with the book creation. You can cre ask them to create a book. You can use tons of tools that we could come up with as, for example, we could do something with iMovie, which I've done in projects with the storytelling. We could do something with um, Flipgrid, which is, I believe that you have mentioned there. We can create a video and we can create a story through Flipgrid and have them record their own story and send it to us. This, again, has to be meaningful and has to be age appropriate and level of acquisition appropriate. And the next slide, we have measuring liquids with, with a measuring cup. Again, we stop and have make it make a meaningful a meaningful moment. And we have the Pyrex cup by measuring liquids. We use that for math as well. Again, more language of math, more into integration of ingredients, more integration of promotion of interactive language and math skills at home. We can measure the liquids, ounces. We could measure milliliters through the Pyrex. So again, we could also do it in both languages. We could code switch. Some homes speak Spanish, we could do Spanish L1 or continue only with English only. Uh, on the next slide, we probably have another presenter present our topic of 
uh, engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Milan. That was really helpful. Um, so starting with us now is Sandra Daniel, who's the language coordinator for the Globe Academy. Hey, Sandra, are you on with us? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you guys for featuring us. Um, so I'm the language coordinator at the Globe Academy. We are a K through eight dual language immersion school. We have three languages, language tracks in addition to English. So those are French, Spanish, and Mandarin. And today, what I really wanted to share with you guys is ways that we can engage students in the target language using um, that oral language. I know in these times of distance learning and digital learning, sometimes that, that can be a challenge. So um, in our CAL webinars, we've been learning a little bit about Flipgrid and ways that we can engage learners. So on the next slide, you'll see what we're gonna be talking about today. We have um, a few things that have been really helpful for our teachers, and I think that they will be helpful for um, a lot of you as well, because you do have students that um, are learning a second language. So on the next slide, you'll see one of the features that's really great for that. So Flipgrid has an immersive reader, which is great because Knowing that these are L2 learners, a lot of times their interpreting, um, interpretive reading levels are a bit lower than their interpreting listening. So this is a way that we can help students understand what the question is asking. So one of the things that's really great about this feature is that you can see each unit and each word, kind of like a read-along feature, highlighting as it goes through and then students are actually able to pause this or play this now um, if you're in a situation that you have a student that speaks a different home language or um, you would like to provide other resources for them this is a great way that you can do this so we'll see what that looks like And I think we might be able to hear a little bit better um, if maybe the headphones are taken out. Um, it was muted, so let's try that again. Let's see. I'll go back to the beginning. Un point un papier et écrit un nombre décimal de centaines jusqu'au centième. Did that work? Yes. Okay, great. So <laughs> as you can see, each word is highlighted, so students can either you know, just the same way as Annie replayed um, the, the section, students can do that as well. So if they need to go back or they didn't understand something, they can adjust that. So that's been a really helpful feature. On the next page, um, you're gonna be able to see what it looks like to give students feedback. So we know students are able to submit work, um, but then we can also as teachers give them an idea of tips of what they can do um, as well as showing um, not only orally but also visually so our french immersion teacher caitlin rowe has given feedback to a student so we'll look at that alors pour dire ton nombre c'est 485 et 67 centièmes so what Caitlin's been able to do here is she's able to tell the student another way of saying the word. So correcting them instead of the student saying point or point to say the actual complete number, she's telling them that they can say and. Um, this is a great way that students can get feedback quickly. But then the other great feature is that other students can comment on the work. So you can have, you can use this feature as almost like a turn and talk. So students can kind of simulate that sort of oral um, communication practice. 
another thing that this area is able to do is the teacher can also highlight and star great examples of work so students can be able to refer to those later. She can also hide sections that maybe she doesn't, you know, maybe she's still working with the student on something and they're not ready to have that seen by everyone. So those are great things to keep in mind. So let's look at what student work looks like. So one of the things I wanted to give you guys sort of a sample of different application program uh, problems that our teachers have done. So on the right hand corner, you will see the activity that Ms. Rowe did with her students. So students in this case had the opportunity to choose how they would represent their decimal number or their fraction in expanded form. So they could choose a number and then they had those two options of the decimal or the fraction. So students uploaded their work and were able to explain step by step what they did on their papers. So this Trois fois dix plus quatre fois un plus cinq fois zéro point un plus six. So their students can upload their answers, and again, the teacher can give feedback, and then other students can also comment. As you can see, the student has kind of added in um, little math symbols in the corner. Um, just to make it a little bit more fun and personal. Our third grade um, Mandarin immersion teacher, Shui Lao Shi, she actually did an application problem, problem set. And what she did was a lot of students might not have the opportunity to have paper printed at this time. We're all away from a lot of those devices. So she uploaded a regular piece of paper and showed students how she kind of lined up the numbers so that they can do their questions at home, which was a great way just to do something different and get the kids kind of away from the computer while they work. So we're gonna see an example of what one of her students uploaded. And with apologies if my dogs bark due to the postal carrier arriving. So She's able to hear this, but um, it's really, in this video, you can actually see how exciting it is for the kids. You know, as soon as a student gets on, he's like, hi, my friends. You know, um, it's really a way for students to connect and, and get together. Um, on the left, what you'll see is our Spanish immersion teacher, uh, Senora Marin has uploaded, uploaded one of the application programs from the curriculum that we are using, which is Engage New York. So what she has up there is a word problem. In this case, students are having the opportunity to solve these word problems and then explain what they did. La respuesta de elección 15 es Cameron Tener, 77 centavos en su bolsillo. So this is a great way for students to practice that academic language, you know, and then also on um, some of the new language that they might not be familiar with, like their pocket or about coins and things like that. If the teacher wanted to, the teacher could also put up there some of the, sen the sentence starters so that students could have that available for them as they answer the question. Um, and I think that this has been a really 
great way for homes, we can still come together and connect with language. So we're so excited that we're able to share these things with, with you guys. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Sandra. Really appreciate all the great uh, information that you've shared with us, and hopefully others can use some of uh, the flip grids and some of the stuff that your teachers are are taking a lot of advantage of. So now we're going to move on and talk about the language of math. Okay, Annie, this is you. All right, thank you. Um, thank you to our guest panelists. And so we are hoping that in our future webinars, we can also have people share out either on a previous topic um, or you know the topic of the day or some other applications. And we will be looking more at Flipgrid and other applications that are both virtual and activities for the home. And we invite you to share your own ideas as well. So there'll be a place to offer up if you have, um, if you'd like to present. So I'll let you just look at this cartoon for a moment. So thinking about math language as a complex language on its own, and of course, we could be thinking about uh, language as English, uh, Mandarin, French, Spanish, Amharic, um, any of the languages uh, that your students speak, and some of the cultural differences as well that, um, you know, for example, in other cultures, sometimes they write that decimal with a comma, right? So um, thinking about the complexity of language uh, and, and the uniqueness of the language features of math and that disciplinary language. So most of our states um, require attention to language of math within um, the college and career readiness standards. Most of our math assessments um, require students to use explanation and justification to describe how they solved uh, their their problems and so in thinking about ways that math teachers make their you know in requests that their students use math language sometimes there's some journaling explaining math concepts or applications of math and then there's also opportunities for cooperative learning explaining to other students in very authentic ways and communicating mathematical ideas um, justifying how someone, which approach strategy someone used and how that helped them to arrive at the answer. So these are just some of the ways that math language is used. We originally thought of doing a poll as to who here is teaching about math, but I think you'll see that a lot of the ways that we're going to talk about math language are everyday ways and opportunities that we can leverage from within the home. I'm not going to read all these um, to you, and again, you will have these slides. If you could just scan for a moment some of these elements and features of math language um, from prepositions. So in, in order to turn, teach vocabulary around math, we would want to focus on some of these phrases, subtract from, multiply by. So these are terms that are often used together and, and best taught and used at the phrasal level. Um, you know, using um, formula and equation language. Steps of a process, helping students justify and explain their answers in terms of a sequence. Signal terms for addition, right? All of those um, terms have a similar meaning or indicate some addition. And then we have signal words for multiplication and division and thinking about how, you know, sometimes they're not always um, you know, that, that we need more than just the language of, of the specific vocabulary, but also to look at other elements within the, the language of math in order to, to really find out what the questions are asking. So we're going to just take a, a moment or two to look at this math problem, sort of a typical something you might find in a math text. Go ahead and read this problem, if you will and identify some of the language challenges that you see in this, let's call it a problem set. So go ahead and read this, and then in the chat box, what do you see 
some of the features of language of math that I just identified or some other difficulties of this. Okay, just a moment before we before we do move on. Um, so in thinking about language challenges within this math problem, first of all, students, we may consider, you know, before we get to the language, how many of our students have experienced a restaurant where um, there might be a tip, right? So some of our students, um, depending on income levels, may be going to um, get takeout food or just based on family business practices or or right now let's look at you know how many of us are are, are not going to um, sit down for restaurant meals because of restrictions tips also very cultural um, and and country specific in terms of um, and I don't usually refer to as a service tip and then you know looking at that first question have you ever noticed that when people eat at a restaurant you know dot 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 Typically, um, you know, these types of math problems or even science texts will start with something very familiar, right? Or like you're walking along the beach and suddenly there's erosion. And so it places the student as the uh, person in the scenario and then suddenly goes to hard facts. So you're moving from um, one little scenario in your mind to um, a, a content question. In addition, some of you pointed out uh, some phrases such as amount to, amount of, total amount, um, percentage of. So a lot of different language examples, um, the greater the restaurant bill, the greater the tip. There's a, you know, a sentence structure that may not be familiar to students. So there's a lot of math challenges and language challenges within this um, problem. And we didn't even get to the question, which will be something that we'll talk about in just a moment. So now my colleague Maria is going to join us and show us some great activities. Okay, yeah, so we're gonna go back to Flipgrid because just like when we're with our students uh, in the classroom remotely, we have to consider some supports for our English learners and actually any of our students when it comes to content area teaching. And so um, when we look at over here at our K2 Flipgrid, task would you rather share plate a or plate b uh, we're going to go to the web or you can see the screenshot that we or we can go to the flipgrid link that i attached three different videos one is an introduction to fraction one is to a, a book called give me half and another one was about the concept of fair share because we're trying to build that content knowledge but also the language as well that's in it in in math and i uploaded a handout that has a word bank some of the and some math content vocabulary cards from the virginia department of education don't forget to go to your local district and state websites for ready to use materials take a screenshot of the pages and now it becomes a digital anchor chart for students to reference as they are learning remotely I also attached a handout for students to draw mathematical representations and then draw the question using a sentence starter. For the grade three to five flip grid, um, I also went to a website called wouldyourathermath.com. And the author John suggests that using the would you rather prompts on a particular day of the week is going to be important. For example, you could have a would you rather Wednesday routine instead of doing it every single day. Remember that teachers are building math concepts and mathematical language simultaneously. So I attached, again, a video about unit pricing, a rap math video on estimation, and a music video created by a third grade class about rounding numbers. What's great about Flipgrid is that you can edit the topic quickly and upload materials to the grid easily. As I reflect on the word bank, 
I could have included rounding to the once place as a term for students to use in their response. What other math vocabulary terms could you use for this math topic? And as you're working on the responses in there, we're also going to share uh, an example from grades six to eight, because I do want you to notice some differentiation in how I change the graphic organizer. In the third to fifth grade example, I incorporated the sentence starter into the writing box, and students only have to write in the option they chose, option A or B. But for this uh, sixth to eighth grade example, students have to rewrite the entire sentence starter before writing their response. So again, we can have differentiation when we're doing remote work. In the high school example, I added tier three words, which are content specific math terms. Uh, but I also added tier two vocabulary terms that are used in other content areas, such as science and phys physical education. For example, the words uh, data, score, and results. All right, and to end this, uh, we're gonna take a little break from Flipgrid and move on to the next part of our PowerPoint, which is called Book Creator. And we mentioned it last week, and so I'm just gonna quickly review that you can find a resource page that has links to many different grade levels and many different content areas. The free version, you and your students can create 40 books uh, online. Uh, and we're gonna go to my example, which is on the next slide. And the book that I created was called Shapes All Around Me. And what we're going to do is, you know, flip through a couple of the pages. And what you'll notice, it's, it's just like create, I, I, I used uh, like a, it's kind of like a Google Doc or a Google uh, Classroom kind of, or Google Docs uh, or Word PowerPoint where you just add text boxes and drawings and upload sound and, um, they can you can read it with them you could sing along with them you could even if we turn to the next page oh it says name the objects or look for circles triangles and squares in your house what can you find so it can be an interactive book as well uh, and the when we go back to the powerpoint you'll notice that there's a link to um, a math teacher's high school book um, on algorithms and we don't have time right now to explore it but the link is there for you to see how um, high school, uh, how a high school teacher was able to create his own book. Oh, I think Annie's got it up over here. So if you scroll down, you'll notice there's a bookshelf and there are different options for different grade levels. But it's a fun thing to explore. Okay, the one last activity that I'm going to share before Maribel uh, shares a few other activities, it's called forget the question. And when we think about math word problems, sometimes the students will know exactly what to do, but others are completely lost as to where to start. So one of the solutions is to use the I notice, I wonder brainstorm, but only using the mathematical scenario. And so you need to leave out the question. This is an opportunity to tap into and build students background knowledge about the information that is in the word problem. You should only reveal the question after students understand the scenario, scenario thoroughly. You can ask the following question. If this story were the beginning of a math problem, what could the math problem be? On the next slide, we will share how to do this activity remotely using a collaborative Google Slides activity. So I don't know if you've used uh, Google Slides before as a collaborative work, but I have created something here for you. So we're gonna just make a copy of it. Hmm, well, we're gonna, you know, Annie, if you could go to the, the let's see, there's a bit.ly that goes direct. Oh, there it is, perfect, okay. So as you notice that I created a video using Screencast-O-Matic, which is a free add-on to Google. And we're gonna listen to the video of how, um, how the task is set up for the students. Today's math center activity is called Forget the Question. Listen to the instructions on the next slide. 
Step one, listen to the math story on the next slide. What do you notice? What are you wondering about? Step two, think about the details in the math story and draw a picture of starters. I notice, I wonder. Choose a new slide and use Google Drawings to draw a picture. Add a text box and write. Insert pictures to help me understand what you are thinking about. Or if you want, you can draw a picture on a piece of paper, take a picture of it using your phone or iPad or other digital device, and upload the photo to your slide. Step three. Next, go to the Tools tab and find the Voice Type Speaker Notes under the Tools in the toolbar. Let me show you where it is. This is where the toolbar is, and here is where you're going to click and find the microphone. This is the Voice Type Speaker Notes icon. Click on it, and you'll notice that somewhere this icon will go uh, and you'll just move it, click on it and move it to where you want to see it. Click on the button and you will notice that everything that you're going to say out loud is going to be typed in the presenter notes section. Isn't that cool? When you click it one more time, it will actually stop typing. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and listen to the math story. Math story number one. Jason has 14 purple marbles and 27 yellow marbles. Melanie has 48 yellow marbles. Click the plus icon in the toolbar to add your own slide and complete the task. Let me show you where the plus sign is. It's right over here in this corner. Click on it, and here you will find a slide that says add a slide. Click, and your new slide will appear. You need to type your name in the little box down below, and then you can insert images, text boxes, and shapes. Do you remember how to do this? We can also change the color if you'd like and then readjust the shapes. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to use the sentence frame, I notice, I wonder. Let's go to the next slide so you could see my sample. This is what I drew. I drew a picture of Jason and Melanie and lots of marbles. I, I use circles and I use the color purple and yellow. Let me practice one more time using my microphone here. I'll click on it and then tell you about my picture. This is Jason. I noticed that Jason has 14 purple marbles. Jason also has 27 yellow marbles. Melanie only has 48 yellow marbles. I wonder how many marbles they have all together. Now it's your turn. Go to a new slide and tell me what do you notice and what do you wonder? And so I went to um, alicekeeler.com um, to get the Google uh, collaborative Google Slides template, but also if you go into type um, the keyword collaborative Google Slides template, her um, template will come right away. Uh, we're also sharing this Google Drive so that you can, if you would want to copy this um, um, PowerPoint slide and then create your own little video, it's very easy. I like free, so I use Screencast-O-Matic to, um, to create the video. All right, so we're going to go on to Madi, and she's going to share some other activities. Oh, no, sorry. We're going to do a poll right now. How confident are you in assessing and creating digital resources for the instruction of English learners? Are you a beginner, intermediate, advanced, or proficient? And this is going to help us uh, to know how much explanation do we need for certain apps in the future, or um, do we just or like what are you interested in learning at the are you a beginner, intermediate, advanced, or proficient? 
And so the poll is in progress right now. We can see that most of you are in the, oh, half of you are intermediate and half are beginner. So uh, we'll be sharing, it looks like a, how, a lot of how-to videos as well, um, but also for some advanced. Uh, we're gonna be looking for you uh, to help uh, support uh, the rest of us uh, with working remotely. So it looks like 43% are beginners, 46 are intermediate, 11% are advanced, and 3% are proficient. And that, those are the results of our poll. Thank you for participating. So we're hoping that all of these um, activities that we're sharing are, are very useful for you. And we're gonna go back to our PowerPoint slide in just a second. Okay, so all the technology is awesome. I consider myself intermediate, so definitely I like some more hands-on things to do at home. And we're gonna present a few activities that we can do at home as a family or have teachers uh, set up for groups of students. And one of them here is called Beat the Clock Toss. This is a lot like hot potato. Uh, what you do is you give a ball to a student, another student is a timekeeper, they set up the timer, and they toss the ball around while giving answers to specific concepts. So for example, the six times tables, or the names of geometric shapes, or counting by twos up to 50 or 100, counting by fives or tens or twelves. So the fun part is the ball goes around, the person who uh, the, you're never out, and you really try to beat the clock. That's who you're going against to so try and get the whole concept covered in that amount of time. Our next activity here are multiplication dominoes. Now, if you're from a culture that plays dominoes a lot, you probably have dominoes somewhere around the house. If not, you can go to Google Images and download uh, pictures of entire domino sets. All you have to do is print and cut them out. Or you can have your kids make them. Uh, some friends of mine made some great dominoes using cardstock and rectangles. So it was very easy to get the dominoes created. In this activity, you put the dominoes face down. Students pick, take turns picking up two dominoes. They add up the number of pips on each domino and then they multiply them. So in the example here, we have a five three, which is eight. We have a five one that's six, eight times six is 48. Another variation can be turning the dominoes into fractions. The five three or the three five becomes three-fifths plus one-fifth equals four-fifths. For younger students, you can do this with addition and subtraction and actually have kids start creating equations for the older ones. Our next one here is Battleship. This is a lot of fun. Now, part of the fun here is that the kids actually figure out the answers on their worksheets ahead of time, and they compare their answers to make sure that they're right. Afterwards, they set up two uh, pieces of manila uh, folders. They have a game board with two sections. In one section, they're gonna fill in their secret locations. And in the other section, they're gonna record their hits and misses. Students take turns where the, op the opponents ask each other the answer and the equation. If they're right, it's a hit. If they're wrong, it's a miss. The first student to hit all of their opponent's answers wins. In your handouts today, I actually put some sample game boards and a sample of how to play it. It's a lot of fun and it's a great way of getting kids to interact with the math and actually use the academic vocabulary. Our next one, I'm gonna leave up to Kate because she actually played this one. It's called Race to 27. I did play this one. Um, it was a lot of fun. I played it with my kids who, if you've been with us the past couple of weeks, you have seen and we'll get to see again. So they're in kindergarten and second grade. We did race to 27. 
um, as, as a family. And what you do is pass out all of a regular deck of playing cards. We took the jokers out. Uh, we counted face cards as 10 and aces as one. And the players turn over one card at a time. We take turns going around in a circle and they add the value of the cards as, they, as you go around the turn. Um, play continues until the total reaches 25 or over. And then that player who puts down the card that took it to 20 or 27, excuse me, 27 or over, takes the whole, the whole pile of cards and you keep playing until everyone is out of cards. Um, so race to 27 worked well for my kids who, like I said, are in kindergarten and second grade. Um, but if you have older kids um, or you're working with older students, you could certainly do race to 50 or race to 100 where they would have to be adding larger numbers for a longer period of time. So let's see a little video of my family playing this game. So that equals, do you remember how much that equals? 10. 10, okay, we're at 10. Oh, eight, one. 21, oh, what's 10 plus one? Oh, 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 16? Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. 16 plus 5. Equals 19. No, but 6 plus 5. Six. 11. Huh? That'd be 21. Yeah. Why? Your turn. 21. <laughs> plus 10 is. What's 20 plus 10? <laughs> plus 1. Plus 1. 30 plus one. Yeah, so a lot of them. Wee! You went to the ground. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you can see um, that the kids had a lot of fun and we kept going. Um, Zara actually did end up being the winner in the end. Uh, but it was a great way for them to practice some mental math. We did have some paper available in case they wanted to write down um the addition numbers so they could keep track um but you could see that they were using some mental maps or was counting on her fingers at one point so it's a great way for them to develop some automaticity with numbers and number relationships and it's a lot of fun okay so our next oh mary bell this is back to you with the mnemonics yeah, I, I always found that mnemonics really helped students and a lot of us use it all the time. But one of the fun things that I found is to have kids create their own. So this came uh, from PromethianPlanet.com, but I thought it was a really great um, mnemonic because it was created by kids. So hey, diddle diddle, the median's in the middle, you add and divide for the mean. The mode is the one that appears the most and the range is the difference between. So mnemonics really keeps things in kids' hands. So I always thought it was a great way of doing this. And speaking of mean, medium, mode, and range, we did another activity. So in this one, uh, you use anything that you can use to build. Plastic cups, blocks, Jenga blocks, whatever object is readily available. You hand them out to the students. And what they do, in a, and you do this in different trials, so that in either one minute or 30 seconds, they have to build a tower. Then they record the number of cups or the blocks or the objects. They do rounds to, uh, and trials to figure this out. And then they have to figure out the mean, median, mode, and the range. Let's see what this looks like. In this one, there were two rounds of four trials each. These cups were handed out. The first round was for one minute. Second round was 30 seconds. We were surprised at just how many cups they actually use in that amount of time. As you can see at the bottom, uh, what the mean medium mode was for each one of the rounds. 
Again, in the handouts, uh, we gave you some samples uh, to work with this. And it's a lot of fun and it's a great way of actually physically figuring things out. For example, the median, if they can't figure out, they can put them in a straight line and count from each end until they find the median. Same thing with the mode, figuring out which number shows up the most and the range. So this is a really great activity. Now there's another activity coming up that I'm not sure how it works. Who can help me out with this one? I got you, Mary Bell. <laughs> um, this is what I used to do with my English learners um, in elementary, usually third and fourth graders. Uh, when they were using story problems, they had a lot of difficulty moving from the story problem to figure out what they actually had to do uh, with the math and getting to the equation. And the problem is that even though we would give them keywords to map with operations, there's a lot of variability in how story problems can be written, and that can be really confusing for students. So this one focuses really on language. Um, and it's a way for students to practice moving from the equation and building in language backwards up to a story problem. So what you do is you start ideally with a full visual equation. Um, so here I took some pictures. Ideally, I could make a flip grid since we can't see our students. Or if you're working at home, you could do this in front of your um, children. So you want to demonstrate the equation. So here the the equation was eight times three minus nine. So I started out with a bowl with eight, three bowls with eight marbles in each bowl. And then in the second picture, I've moved nine of those marbles to a plate. So I want to just show it first without any words and then begin to build in language first by naming the equation orally. So eight times three minus nine equals 15. Now I'm going to build in more language. Now I'm going to start naming some objects. So right here we have bowls and marbles. So three bowls with eight marbles in each bowl, take away nine marbles equals 15. And then on the next slide, you'll see how we continue to build language into this problem. Okay, so now we're gonna add some people, same situation. I have three bowls with eight marbles in each bowl. I take away nine marbles. How many marbles do I have left? We've now made it a question. And now we work at changing the people and changing the containers. So Maria has three boxes of chocolates. Each box contains eight chocolates. She gives nine chocolates to her friends. How many chocolates does Maria have left? At this point, I have, I would have my students break up into groups and work together to come up with how many show the operations. Um, the, the variation in ways that the same equation can be expressed. So it really gives, um, gives students a chance to work with language and variability before they're moving into the equation. Sometimes I would take uh, a story problem as my target story problem, and then I would do this backwards with a similar problem, and then I would give them the target story problem after they've had a chance to do their own work building in the language backwards. Um, so I'm not, there may be one more slide on this. I'm trying to remember if I stopped. Yeah, so practicing backwards it does help the learners to think more flexibly when they're moving from a story problem to the actual math equation and demonstrates the wide variety of language that can be used to show the same equation. You can differentiate it for learners at different grade levels um, and different language proficiency levels. And it's easily adaptable to a Flipgrid activity. You could make your video demonstrating the equation and then they could make videos back building out that language to a story problem. And it can be done at home with everyday objects. I didn't bother recording this one, but I did do this simply with my two children. And it was funny with the same equation, we just did three plus four equals seven. My daughter came up with a very complicated way of describing how to add these together. And my son just said, Mommy has four marbles. I have three marbles. Mommy gave me four marbles. And now I have seven marbles. But my daughter said, oh, Joe has three marbles. And John has four marbles. And Zara has no marbles. So Joe and John decided they wanted to give Zara all their marbles. Now they don't have any. But how many does Zara have? which if we wrote that out in a story problem, we wouldn't even really find those keywords that we're normally telling um, 
giving our students as indicators for operations. But this is a way for them to think more flexibly about what those words are meaning. Okay, Annie, I think you're gonna tell us about this one, right? Yes, and I loved your examples. I love that you pointed out that Zara run the card game. I think she would find that very necessary information. Yes, she um, would. <laughs> and I also love that Maria was the Maria does share all her chocolates with us. <laughs> so <laughs> her dish and her um, her candy. So uh, very um, authentic examples. And um, yeah, so we just have a couple more slides and um, this is in your handouts and in many of these activities again the powerpoint we have um, a site for you to download all of this and um, you know share this webinar if you have colleagues um, as well so the last set of your handouts is around this idea of the teddy bear hunt so a lot of if you if you haven't heard about this yet um, on many of the social media apps or perhaps if you just google uh, teddy bear hunt particularly right now with a lot of kids indoors and i've heard of kids in their teens enjoying this as well although less admittedly um so these teddy bear hunts or in my neighborhood people are putting any kind of stuffed animal and in, in windows or in their gardens and on sunny days it's a little more organized um and so people kids will walk in a you know socially distant way um apart from each other with their families though and um, what a great opportunity to create and analyze data charts regarding uh, what they're seeing. So with tally marks, data tables, bar graphs, and pie charts, in your handouts, you have a number of examples. We put all our handouts in Word so that you can manipulate them. Um, and of course, you could modify what are the categories that you think are important or that your, your children and students think are important. Is it teddy bears versus other kinds of stuffed animals or um, one of the charts there has them divide into species of um, classifications, birds, mammals, uh, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates because apparently there's all kinds of stuffed animals out there. Um, and you know adding a little a layer you could just do teddy bears and stuffed animals or perhaps teddy bears that are outside versus inside and stuffed animals that are outside and inside and then there's some suggested sentence stems there there's a lot more um, and the bar graphs should hyperlink to an excel if you have that microsoft availability um, for students to be able to enter in the labels depending on your, your students and, and children's levels so um, just something to as you're out and about if you would like to um, use that data for math purposes um, so we know that it's four o'clock and uh, we did wanna give you a little opportunity to share out as well. And so um, we'll leave this going. I know some of you might need to drop off, but for another three minutes, just to capture maybe one of these ideas or activities has, has spoken to you that you'd like to adapt and use at home, um, or maybe there's a resource that you've been using that you'd like to share. So we'll, we'll continue on the questions chat box for another two minutes before we do our our final wrap up but please do add your ideas there and we will um be able to comment there and uh as well you'll get a ticket out at the end of this uh presentation definitely we'd like to thank our two panelists milagros and sandra for sharing today and um this information will all be up on, online too. But if you have a question specifically for one of them, we can also get it to them. So another couple minutes for any questions you have.
Okay, so we are unfortunately um, out of time. Uh, just a couple of uh, people's questions were related to um, the resources here. So um, as you can see, I'm gonna highlight it. Oh, I don't know if I can highlight, but down here, um, down here in where it is a little bit yellow highlighted, you have this website. And this is the website where we have all of our archived webinar. So this webinar, once recorded, will be uploaded there. And you also have the past two webinars and these, these PowerPoint um, PDFs and the handout packet as a Word document. And we welcome you as well to share out if you try. I know a few of you said that you're hoping to get your teachers to try out Flipgrid. Um, there's lots of ways to leverage both the virtual technology that we have as well as the materials in our homes um, to really amplify the language that our students are using. So we welcome you to that website and we have a number of resources for you there. We'll also have the link for our next webinar. Our next webinar is a holiday for some and uh, spring break I know for others. So we've decided to move our, our science and language to the April 20, 17th, sorry, Friday, April 17th. We'll be back same time same place and there's your registration link but also all of what you see here in this slide will be sent to you within the day in an email format so you will get a certificate for your participation as well as these links and um, and our thank yous in that in that email that will come out within 24 hours so um, check back the web website and we really thank you for your participation and hope you have a wonderful weekend. Please stay healthy and safe.